Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining. My name is Kellen Betts. I'm honored to be your co-host for today. I'm a course lead in the MITx MicroMasters program in supply chain management. I'm also involved in omnichannel and sustainability related research here at MIT Center for Transportation and Logistics. And I'm honored to have my co-host here, my colleague, uh, Laura Lega. Hi, Kellen. Hi, everyone, and welcome. I'm Laura Ajege. I'm also course lead in the MicroMaster in Supply Chain Management program. You probably have seen us already. And I'm involved in omnichannel sustainability and online education research at the MIT Center for Transportation and Logistics. Today, we're so fortunate to have here with us Mr. Amit Kilkami. Uh, um, Amit is the Divisional Vice President of Supply Chain, Merchandising, and Co-op Brands Technology at REI. And he has over 20 years of experience in information technology. With that, he will share recent insight from his work at the company. So we are very glad to have you join us today. Um, so welcome, Amit. Thank you. All right, before um, we get started um, with the discussion, let's get out of the event with a quick poll. We'd like to learn more about what you're hoping to get out of this event. And so let me launch that poll number one now, please. Awesome. So the, the poll question, why are you here today? Um, just a few different options. You know, I want to learn about supply chain technology and systems. I want to learn about maybe REI in the outdoor industry. Um, hopefully we have some MicroMasters and some SEM students here and you don't miss any live events. That's um, always awesome. Um, and while we do that, I'll share a little bit about the agenda for today. And so for the next few minutes, we'll have Amit write a little background on what he does and how it relates to our topic today. We'll then ask some questions that we have prepared. And then the last 15 minutes will be saved for your questions. And so please use that webinar Q&A, that little button on the bottom, that webinar Q&A feature to ask your questions and be sure to log, be logged in with a name. And we won't be reading any anonymous questions. And we'll also share a few more polls during the event. So be prepared to participate. Um, and let's check in on our results of that first poll. Okay, so I can see that most of you want to learn about supply chain technology and system and you want to see how it can improve your supply chains. So that's awesome. We will cover all the topics that are here. So we are very happy that you're interested on that. And with that in mind, I want Amit uh, to get started. So I don't know if you're ready Amit to start. We would love to start by learning more about your background. Yeah, sure. Um, I'll start a little bit about myself. Um, I've been working in supply chain related technologies for over 20 years now. Uh, I have been with REI for a little over seven years. In my current role uh, at REI, I support teams that work on supply chain, order management, merchandising, co-op brands, product design and development, uh, and our ERP system. These technologies are foundational for REI's transformation. It is an exciting space to be in for sure. So a little bit about REI. Uh, many of you probably know REI already, and I'm hoping some of you are even uh, co-op members. A quick overview for those of you who may not be familiar. Uh, REI is a member-owned cooperative retailer based in the United States. Uh, at REI, we believe time outside is fundamental to a life well-lived. We exist to inspire and enable life outside for everyone. Today, the REI community has over 20 million lifetime members, nearly 15,000 employees, and 168 locations. REI uh, sells outdoor gear and apparel. We offer rental equipment, uh, resupply, which is our circular commerce offering, and also outdoor experiences like travel group activities and classes. Being a member-owned cooperative, or what we refer to as the co-op, is fundamental to REI. It allows us to focus on shared values and not share value. This connects nicely to the theme for today's event about creating customer value. And I wanted to share a very short video about co-op membership. Can play the video, please. The more we get out there, the more we discover that there's a community with room for everyone and a membership that never expires that goes wherever we go, that loves what we love. Hey. Always welcoming us Hello. outside. REI, better is out there. Thank you. 
so one way to think about that video is that it shows the ideal customer experience at REI, our customer is the co-op member who is engaged in outside activities. So as supply chain professionals, how do we create customer value for all of these members? How does the omni-channel experience fulfill on the vision that we just saw in that video? Awesome. Well, thank you, Amit. We're super happy to have you here today. Um, thank you again for sharing your time and your knowledge with us today. Um, we're also super proud to have a SEM MicroMasters alumni here to share your experience today. It's very exciting for us. Um, so let's dive into my, our main topic and connect me with that question that you left us with there. Um, how does omnichannel experience bring value to um, customers or in your case, co-op members? Um, from my personal experience at REI, you can buy in REI stores, you can buy at REI.com and have it shipped to you. Um, you can buy online and then go to the store and have it picked up and all these kind of different types of channels. Um, so what we would like to know first is what are some of the unique challenges that this omni-channel strategy presents um, compared to like a pure e-commerce or a pure brick and mortar retailer, um, maybe from a technology and systems perspective. And then how does this um, strategy help create customer value? Yeah, thanks, Kalen. Sure, let's dive in. Uh, the omni-channel strategy is a key enabler for driving the customer experience and customer value. Uh, the various fulfillment choices that you just described earlier, online, in-store, uh, across all of the channels, those used to be a differentiator in the past. But now, as we are seeing digital and store experiences uh, continue to blend together, and digital is driving significant growth. So in that situation, uh, these are almost becoming table stakes now. And with that, the complexity continues to grow. And it's not just for technology, but it's for people, processes from all of those perspectives. The primary driver for this added complexity is the sheer number of additional choices and decisions uh, that will be made, both by the customers, but also by the retailer. You reference the pure e-commerce or brick and mortar uh, models and retailers there. So in those models, the decisions are not easy, but relatively straightforward. You have a single pool of inventory that the customers can choose from. In both of those models, you have a single primary channel that is generating uh, most of your demand. And you have relatively limited options to fulfill this demand from. So enter the world of omnichannel and the number of the variables just expands in a non-linear fashion. Um, I'll share some numbers from uh, REI perspective. Um, 20 million members, we have three, the three, soon to be four distribution centers. We have 168 stores. We have more than thousand vendors. So with all of these, the complexity just grows. And there are key uh, themes uh, that I would talk about. There are three of them. Uh, the first one being inventory and availability. Second is the customer promise. And third is optimizing the total cost to serve while maximizing the customer experience. So in each of these three themes, uh, there are a number of foundational decisions that you need to make, uh, which is going to drive how your network and customer experience is going to be set up. So let's take the first theme of inventory and availability. Some of the key questions here are, how do you decide on available to promise inventory? Do you have dedicated and separate inventory pools by channel, one for e-commerce, one for stores? Or do you have a shared inventory pool? Also, when we have stores, the inventory picture in the stores is changing throughout the day as walk-in customers transact. And do you have any additional sources of inventory outside of your network? So for example, if you are partnering with your dropship partners, uh, that creates additional complexity because they may not have the inventory pools dedicated to you. They may be serving uh, multiple retailers. So getting the inventory and availability right is the foundational piece, which is going to drive all of the downstream customer experience. Then when you have made all of these decisions, it comes to the customer promise. As the customer is transacting, what are the different choices for the customer? That's going to be driven by, if you have all of the stores, do you ship from all the stores like we do? What are the different options? Whether it is shipping to your home, shipping to store, picking up from a store, or even an offsite location. And then what are the different levels of service that you offer? Do you offer next day, two day shipping, and then based on all of these combinations, what is the date that you're going to promise to the customer? That's the most important uh, aspect here in terms of setting the right expectation uh, for the customer to receive the product. And once you have both of these set up, it really comes down to optimization. Now you 
have so many of these foundational decisions that are going to lead you to a number of different constraints that you would need to optimize against. You have shipping costs from different locations. You have processing costs at the distribution centers and the stores. You have the capacity, both uh, individual capacity at the location level, and then you have the aggregate capacity and throughput of your network. When you have stores, the product is selling through at the store locations at different rates, and that's going to influence uh, how you manage your uh, inventory life cycle in terms of the markdowns or uh, stockouts and things like that. So I think I just rattled through a bunch of decisions there. So all of these decisions create uh, a very interesting challenge for technology. We need to have systems in place that will have reliable, accurate, and near real-time information about all of this inventory. And then we need to have uh, optimization engine and models in place that can dynamically respond to various situations. As we go through the year, we have different events. We have typical holiday season, you have any special events, or you can run into uh, any of the external constraints that you did not even see. Uh, pandemic was a great example, which I know we're going to talk a little bit more in details. So you need to have technologies and systems in place uh, to also support the operations inside your buildings, whether it is distribution center, store operations. So collection of systems uh, that work together is a critical success factor in getting omnichannel right. It's ERP, warehouse management, order management system, points of sale. Uh, all of these are various building blocks. And eventually, um, your digital properties, whether it is your website or mobile app, uh, those are going to consume this information and craft engaging customer experiences. So it's really quite challenging to integrate all of these systems in near real time and make sure that you can deliver on a great customer experience. So as any uh, retailer, when you start bringing this omnichannel strategy and experiences to life, the initial experiences may feel transactional. At times, they may also feel disjointed across the channels. I go to a store, I see one thing, I go to your digital property, the inventory availability picture may not seem consistent and it could be disjointed. That's the early stage of omnichannel. But as the capabilities mature, as you have more systems, technology and processes in place, and when you get it right, the end result that we're aspiring for is a seamless and frictionless customer journey. Uh, and the customer value that this entire model creates is in a wide selection of products and services, uh, in flexibility for accessing those products when and how the customers want them, and hopefully they build a lifelong relationship with your brand. Thank you, Amit, for those great insights and very detailed one. I, I think our audience would love them on creating a seamless omnichannel customer experience. That's amazing. We also know that companies need to eventually redesign the distribution networks, and this could be because of disruptions, capacity issues, or even to provide improved customer service as is, or satisfy change in demand. So connecting with what you just said, uh, recently the company announced that you're opening the new and fourth distribution center. So we wanted to know um, what role did technology play in evaluating the network design and making decisions in terms of um, what's the new additional capacity we would need in the network and also understanding that I think it's going to be located in Tennessee, correct me if yeah. I'm wrong. How did you make that choice? So we would love to learn more about that. Yeah, that's a great question. So as we said, companies need to be constantly reviewing their supply chain networks to ensure that they're set up to meet both the growth that is happening in the business, but also the ever-changing customer needs. And technology and data play a critical role uh, in modeling the network and also helping inform with the decision, such as the location selection, as you described, where do we open the distribution center? What is the product flow mix that is flowing through uh, the existing network as well? Uh, and at REI, we use our distribution centers to serve both the stores uh, as well as e-commerce and digital orders. So that adds even more complexity uh, when we want to make sure that the right mix of product is flowing through these buildings. Uh, in addition, we are also a specialty retailer. Uh, so our number of days of supply in any given location, is pretty low, especially when you compare it to a big box retailer. So in stocks are super important for us. And the proximity has a huge impact in maintaining the healthy in stock levels inside the stores. And then technology absolutely played a pivotal role in evaluation of the network design. It all starts with customers first and utilizing the technology and data that we have 
um, to understand the key markets, the demographics, to strategically place a distribution center that is close both to our stores uh, as well as to our customers. So throughout all of our uh, systems, we have a ton of data uh, around where our customers and members live, where the demand originates, where it is actually fulfilled from, what's the product and the category mix uh, that the customers are purchasing, what's the time taken to deliver the product uh, after the order is placed to the customers, and what's the replenishment cycle and time frame to get the product to the stores. So we have this ton of data, uh, but you obviously need tools uh, on top of that. So this data coupled with network design and modeling software uh, is critical in selecting the location and also designing the flow. And the other piece that I will add there is the technology doesn't stop when we uh, select a location, but now that you have added a new node to the location, the complexity of the network grows even more. So you now have even more variables. So you need to have the end-to-end -end agility and flexibility in the supply chain to respond to uh, any changes, whether it is demand, customer behavior, you name it. And then we need to have the technology in place to deliver operational efficiency, simplicity inside the DCs, uh, all the way from material handling equipment to warehouse management software to the user experience that you're going to see. Uh, so answering the question about how did we decide uh, to open this distribution center in Tennessee, this is the classic um, location selection optimization problem that I'm sure you're studying in uh, the design and other courses in details. So there are a few considerations and constraints that I'll talk through. So we took all of these um, into consideration and optimized against those. Uh, the first one is the network capacity and throughput. So given our growing uh, demand, both in stores as well as in our digital channel, what's the total capacity uh, that we need in terms of just the storage as well as the throughput through the DCs and the stores. That was uh, one of the key considerations. Uh, the second uh, and really important point is around the speed to customer. Uh, so with now this expanded network, we can offer various uh, levels of service, faster shipping to our customers, such as two-day shipping. Uh, just to put uh, it in perspective in some numbers, uh, the Tennessee Distribution Center uh, is going to have about 5.6 million existing members that are residing in the area that would be served uh, by the distribution center. Out of our 168 stores, 70 stores uh, can receive the product from this distribution center. So this uh, represents a significant increase in the coverage in number of members that we can reach uh, with a two-day shipping range with just standard shipping. Um, then the third element there is around the cost to serve. So we want to optimize the overall cost across the network uh, and also have the required agility. And I think the fourth and uh, most important aspect uh, for us uh, from our impact agenda perspective is around sustainability. Uh, I know uh, CTL is doing a lot of research specifically on that sustainability front. So we are looking to leverage industry leading sustainability and technology features both inside the building as well as we are going to get closer to the customers. Um, and with that, we will be able to support our goal of uh, reducing our carbon emissions by 55% by 2030. So those were the four factors and constraints that we applied in our model. And then that led us to the decision of opening the location in Tennessee. That's super fascinating, especially the concept of you know, using a facility for both channels in some sense, you know, replenishment of stores as well as the online, like a true omni-channel, um, you know, distribution center, if you will. Um, I want to kind of pick up on me uh, two ideas um, that you mentioned. So one is the idea of like flexibility and agility. Um, and then the other idea you mentioned earlier is the pandemic obviously being a significant disruption. Um, so these kind of come together in the sense where you have to use, you know, some of these concepts, some of these systems to adapt to this disruption, right? The disruption of the pandemic. Um, um, and so kind of pivot this you know, conversation to disruptions, you know, the past few years, especially with the pandemic, I've seen a lot of them. Um, in our conversation before the event, you mentioned responding to the pandemic with ARIA having to close its stores early on and then reopen them as restrictions ease was kind of a significant challenge. And so can you share maybe a little bit about that experience um, and the role that technology played, um, that flexibility, that adaptability to this disruption? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think pandemic, as for everyone, was a true test of how uh, resilient our processes and technologies were. Uh, we had to assess the situation and utilize the tools that we had in our toolbox to respond to varying challenges that each of the different phases of the pandemic presented. 
and in some cases we did not even have the tools available um, so we had to really build them quickly we had to advance some of uh, the development uh, because they were part of our roadmap or backlog that we were uh, looking to go after so before i talk about how we responded to the pandemic and how we made those adjustments uh, let's take a step back because i think it is very important uh, to understand the context and the maturity of our supply, uh, our supply chain uh, processes as well as technologies to see where we were uh, in hindsight we were fortunate to have a number of omni channel building blocks in place prior to pandemic uh, and we were able to build or solve this jigsaw puzzle by utilizing them so you could say that we were fortunate but then it was not by accident we have been working on our omni channel fulfillment strategy for several years prior to pandemic so we have the inventory visibility across all of our channels whether it is distribution centers stores and dropship vendor partners so we can use this expanded inventory pool to better service the customer needs we also have the ability to use our stores as fulfillment nodes um i think as you mentioned earlier the customers can buy online pick up in store or they can ship to store from our dcs we have wide variety of these fulfillment options and we are also able to offer a wide selection of products to our customers from our dropship partners so when we implemented all of these different fulfillment uh, options and choices for our customers uh, the key the glue that held uh, everything together Uh, was an optimization engine uh, which optimizes the number of countless choices this network and these methods create so we want to be able to uh, optimize the total cost to serve while uh, exceeding uh, the customer expectations and we had the privilege of a really sophisticated omni channel capability with so many optimization levers and this operation was humming uh, even before uh, pandemic so when we were hit by the pandemic obviously we had to take a number of different actions so i'll walk you through three different scenarios uh, the first one is the omni channel operations through various phases of pandemic as you said first phase we had to close all the stores then you could open them but you obviously had to follow a lot of the health and safety guidelines uh, so i'll walk you through all of those operations the second one was we had to create uh, new offerings such as curbside uh, to respond to the pandemic and then the third one is um, as you have heard in the news and media all the time uh, supply chain disruption supply chain shortages that continues to be the theme as we are hopefully coming out of the pandemic so how do we respond to that and what are the new capabilities or customer service adjustments that we have to do to respond to those supply chain disruptions so let's talk about the first one uh, the different omni channel operations um in the first phase the stores had to be closed overnight and we went from this omni channel retailer we had to become an online only retailer pretty much overnight and while digital is growing our store still represent majority of our demand so we had to now take the optimization models that were all set and tuned uh, after a lot of analysis to optimize the total cost to serve and manage all of those constraints we had to make the necessary changes now to balance the capacity and throughput of the distribution centers because all of our demand was essentially being served out of those three distribution centers during that phase so those constraints became really important uh, in this phase so now obviously with all of this demand going on through the digital channel we had to make the adjustments to make sure that the customer promise the date that we are promising to the customers the options that we are promising to the customers are updated to reflect how the operations are keeping pace with this surge in the demand and then obviously the stores were closed so we had to make the necessary adjustments in our systems and processes to make sure that we are not reserving inventory uh, for the store channel uh, which would impact um, the choices or availability uh, for our customers who are transacting primarily in the digital channel now so that was the first phase and then as we entered the subsequent phases of the pandemic now we had the ability to open our stores and utilize them for fulfillment so then we were able to use them to provide some relief for our distribution centers as well as productively utilize the inventory which was within the four walls of the store and more of that inventory was available across the channels because we had fewer number of walk in customers given all of the restrictions the other interesting aspect here is um pandemic drove uh, increases in demand in a lot of categories right uh, everybody wanted to get outside and try to do a certain activities to maintain the health and all of that so bike as an example that was one category 
the demand for which just took off exponentially during this phase. And now this presented a number of different challenges because bike uh, along with just the inventory, there is assembly process that is required. And that assembly process takes place both partly in the DC uh, and then the last set happens uh, inside the stores. So now we had to optimize this fulfillment, not only based on the inventory and the availability across the locations, but we also had to take into account the capacity and the bandwidth available uh, for assembly and various services within those locations. So we had to tweak uh, all of those optimization models and use different levers. Uh, another interesting point uh, with bikes is pre-pandemic, most of our bikes used to be uh, shipped to the store. Uh, we didn't have the ability to ship the bikes to home because they need assembly servicing and all of those things. So now you have fewer options. So the uh, network that you have, which is replenishing the products to the stores, comes with its own uh, constraints and own challenges. So that was another uh, interesting pivot that we had to make uh, during this phase. And then uh, as we were living through that phase, uh, obviously we had to meet all of the health and safety guidelines uh, for our customers and also for our employees. So that led to creation of new fulfillment options. I think you have seen a number of retailers offer the curbside pickup uh, for the health reasons during the pandemic. Uh, so we were able to stand this up relatively quickly. It was really just a matter of weeks before we were able to respond and create that offering. And all of this was possible because we had those uh, buy online, pick up in store and ship to store, both processes and technologies in place. It is very hard to imagine how we could have uh, stood up something like curbside uh, so quickly if we did not have those building blocks. And then... I think the last element that I described earlier is around the supply chain shortages, disruptions, shipping delays, backlog of the uh, ports and all of that. So where are we seeing the impacts uh, from all of those uh, issues? It is certainly impacting the accuracy and timely delivery of our future supply uh, and the inventory that is uh, coming into our network. Uh, so if you're a retailer like us that promises back orders or pre-orders against this future inventory, in anticipation uh, that it is going to be available and manage all of the dates. Well, good luck with that. It's, it's really been a hard problem to solve. So we had to take multiple measures. The first thing was to preserve that customer experience. So we took measures to scale back our uh, backorder capability to respond to these uncertainties and all of the variability that we are seeing. We wanted to make sure that we prioritize the seamless and frictionless customer experience that I talked about earlier we wanted to prioritize that uh, over and above capturing any additional demand. Uh, so we also accelerated um, the development of some new capabilities. So we now have a feature um, on our site, which is called notify me when available. So if the product is not available, you can sign up for notifications uh, when it uh, will become on hand and you can purchase that. It effectively allows you to get on a virtual waiting list for all of the products. So in order to create this customer experience, you need uh, all of the underlying data integration, whether it is the purchase order information, the advanced shipping notification, the dates, the traceability and visibility through all of the supply chain uh, so that we can look at those dates and create uh, these types of customer experiences. So all of that was really critical in building and bringing this capability to life for our customers. Thank you, Amit. And as you say, it was definitely not about just being fortunate, but also about being prepared. And I found very interesting that even though you were very much prepared to deal with the changing landscape impacted by the disruption, you are also very resilient enough to develop new offerings and we always communicated with your members and you never lost the focus on the customer experience while you were describing this. So that's amazing. And I, I appreciate you sharing that with our audience. Yeah. So we want to keep the event interactive and we want to hear from the audience. So I would love to launch the second poll. And this one is about uh, returns, a topic we're very interested on. And I'm sure you're uh, like you in the audience are also interested about that because I've seen some questions already in the Q&A a feature about returns. So thank you for those. We want to know from your side, what are the main reasons that customers returns product at your company, or if not at your company, what are the main reasons that you return products for? It could be wrong products, damaged products, or those probably didn't meet your expectation, or you intentionally did it to just try them on and see what 
comes next. Okay, so thank you. I see this is populating already. So while you all respond, I would love to go back to Amit and we will touch upon this topic. You know that this is one of the areas where rich, uh, researching its returns and reverse logistic and most retail supply chains are designed and optimized for the forward flow of products from manufacturer to an end consumer. And at the same time, accepting returns is, we know, not a new phenomenon, but we know that there are also a new, uh, new dynamics of higher rate of returns and mainly driven by e-commerce growth. And we also know about the complexities of getting something back from a customer that has never visited the store before. So we would love to know from uh, Amid, what has been your experience with circularity in retail, with a reverse flow of products, and of course, how does technology fit into it? And as you always do, bring us the perspective of the customer value. Yeah, definitely. Uh, there are three aspects uh, of returns. One is the customer experience, first and foremost, as you described. Uh, then the second is the reverse logistics and then the reverse flow of the product throughout our network. And the last one is around the circular commerce. So we previously had talked about how omnichannel fulfillment, uh, as you said, from a forward perspective, shapes uh, the customer experience and what are the various challenges and complexities within that. But the omnichannel returns experience is equally important. The ease of return transaction, regardless of where you had made the purchase, whether you had buy, bought the product online, where you're bringing it back to the store, vice versa, all of that is a very big driver of the customer satisfaction. And from a technology perspective, it creates different uh, challenges. Uh, so when we talk about omnichannel fulfillment, you need to have the unified view of uh, inventory so that the customers can transact. Now you flip it on reverse and then you are looking at all of the purchases and uh, orders and the interactions that the customer had made. So if you don't have the ability to have a single view into all of the customer interactions, it becomes uh, really challenging. If you have all of your point of sale and all of the uh, transaction repository over there, you have all of the order history uh, from your digital properties. So if you're not able to combine those, that definitely creates a lot of uh, friction in that experience. And then the process needs to allow for flexibility. You should be able to start a return in any channel. Like I should be able to start the return uh, on the digital channel, create the necessary documentation information that may be required, and then have the ability to send the product back and ship it uh, to, let's say, your processing center, distribution center, whatever the case may be, or bring it back to the store or drop off at a different location. So developing that unified view of orders and allowing the customers to transact against that uh, definitely uh, creates a lot of challenge. And just to put it in perspective, majority of returns for our online orders uh, were still brought back to our stores pre-pandemic. So when we were hit by pandemic again, we had to uh, respond to that. That was another area where we had to really uh, stand up some capability really quickly was around the self-service uh, returns because the returns capability on our digital properties was fairly limited. Um, as the majority of the returns were going back to the stores anyway. So we had to pivot and create that self-service return capability, which we are continuing to uh, mature and eliminate the friction from that return journey as well. So once the customer has interacted and created that return, the reverse logistics and the flow of the product uh, also leads to a number of different decision points. So I create the return, I drop off the product. When should the refund be issued to the customer? Is it when um, the product is dropped off for your with your carriers or when you receive and uh, process the return? I think that's probably the biggest factor uh, from a customer experience perspective that they're looking for. But then when you put uh, your supply chain practitioner hat on, you need to figure out where you want this product. How do you want this product to be dispositioned? A lot of that product is available for uh, resale because some of it is unopened, new. Some of it might be open box and all of that. So... Do you want to bring all of that product into a central location to process and disposition and then fulfill it from there? That's one model that we uh, see in the industry. But the other uh, interesting aspect is, uh, do you want to keep that product in, within that particular local market? Because there was definitely a need and demand for that product uh, within that region. So if you keep it locally within the market, you might be able to uh, get it to the other customers faster and also uh, optimize your inventory management. So I think that's the uh, other aspect. So how you create the optimization on the fulfillment, there is a similar way to create the optimization 
uh, on the reverse logistics side also. And then you talked about the overall circular commerce. Um, that is a very important uh, topic for us because as I said, uh, for REI, uh, sustainability is one of our key impact agenda. Uh, so the uh, circular commerce, the sale of the used uh, gear definitely creates a great opportunity for us uh, from a sustainability perspective. Based on um, the data that we have around preparing the used gear for resale versus uh, creating uh, a similar comparable new product, uh, we see about 50% uh, uh, reduction in the carbon emissions when you talk about the used gear sales. So that circular commerce uh, from a sustainability perspective is a key strategic imperative for us. And returns are a big source uh, of supply for all of that circular commerce. A lot of our uh, used gear supply is coming back from the returns. Um, but technology-wise, it is really challenging uh, to support this end-to-end -end process uh, by having the right technology support in place. Because there are a lot of uh, different complexities and considerations that come in. So uh, predominantly starting with the product information. How do you manage the different quality and the disposition of the product? Is it unopened? Is it open box? Is it lightly used, heavily used? How is that going to be presented to the customer so that they can make the right choice? And obviously based on the disposition and the quality of the product, the pricing has to be set accordingly. And then eventually it's the fulfillment. And then that is driven by some of the factors that I talked about earlier in terms of where you are bringing your returns back. Is it central? Is it through your distribution center? Is it through your dedicated uh, stores uh, that are for uh, your used gears? Or in some cases, it could be even well, a 3PL logistics provider or a third party service provider. So that fulfillment also creates a uh, lot of complexity. And we are still in the infancy in terms of our uh, business model for the circular commerce. So obviously, we have a lot more opportunity in front of us for maturing the business processes and the models, but also from a technology perspective, uh, it's really hard to create that uh, support for the end-to-end -end process. So there is a lot of opportunity in this space uh, to innovate for our students, uh, anybody else who is interested. Uh, circular commerce and sustainability are probably the two biggest areas of opportunity for us. That's fascinating. There's so many fascinating ideas there to unpack. Um, for me, the sustainability piece is uh, very interesting in the, the result that you guys found or the, the research you guys did with finding 50% less for selling a used um, product versus a new product is very fascinating. So much of that upstream supply chain is so challenging to decarbonize or to reduce emissions mm -hmm. from. And so this is one way to kind of address that up front right at that customer experience. Uh, that's fascinating. I'm gonna have to, to dive into that for sure. Maybe we'll have some quick good questions on that at the end. Um, but before we proceed, we wanna um, take a look at our poll, poll results and so we could share that poll result number two. Um, so this is a poll on what are the reasons um, your company or maybe you yourself um, return products. And it looks like um, the majority, a majority kind of Pick two, you know, so damaged and defective product or product did not meet expectations. I think that it makes sense. Um, I'm a little actually surprised to see the delivery expectations didn't meet that. You know, we're all kind of accustomed to this, you know, new same day or you know high speed delivery um, in the e-commerce world, and that that not being a return a reason to return is kind of interesting to see. So, um, and hopefully there's some good comments there in the the chat. I think I saw a few pop up as well. Um, awesome. Um, so I'm just doing a quick quick time check. I think we're going to jump into our final question before we get into some Q&A for um, the audience there. I see a number of questions in the Q&A, so that's awesome. But before we do so, I want to jump into our final question with Amit. Um, and we mentioned previously that Amit is a credential holder, or a McMaster's alumni, which is um, super awesome to have him here. Um, so we'd love to know what inspired you to take the program and how you've been able to use it, um, what you've learned in your career after completing it. Yeah. I'm really proud uh, of being a member of the first ever cohort of the MicroMasters program. I think the structure of the program, which covers the end-to-end -end supply chain, um, the quality of the content and the research at MIT CTL, I think those were the key factors that attracted me to the program. And this has helped me in a number of ways, uh, but I would share three uh, quick highlights. First was it broadened my supply chain knowledge. So as I mentioned earlier that I've been working uh, in the technology field uh, within supply chain for a really long time, but my scope was fairly limited. I was being focused mainly on the omni-channel as well as the distributed order management space. And this program helped me see the big picture of supply chain all the way from network design uh, to analytics, technology, all of that. Uh, second, uh, and I think probably the most important one 
was it helped me connect with my business partners and the supply chain practitioners using a common vocabulary so it's not like as a technologist i'm talking about like the requirements capabilities just from systems perspective but having that deep understanding of the theory of supply chain and its practical applications helped me partner with my stakeholders so that we could co-create and innovate versus trying to understand each other's terminology and language and uh, the omni channel optimization solutions that we talked about earlier those are directly based on some of the concepts that you learn in the supply chain design and the technology courses in the program and lastly uh, it helped me build my uh, network and create connection with respected experts in the field uh, whether it was as a role of my student i participated as a cta for some of the roles uh, for some of the courses as well as through events like this and even uh, pre pandemic in seattle area we had meetups of all of uh, or several of the micro master students uh, taking various courses to build those local connections and learn from each other so i think that's where it has been really uh, helpful for me to apply the learnings um, that i had so i definitely encourage the students to uh, build such connections build your networks and also take the next step and complete the masters program which i wish i could do awesome amit thank you for your encouraging words and for sharing your experience and your greatest takeaways of our courses we are very excited and very proud to have you here with us showing us what you have learned along your professional and educational journey so that's amazing um we will run now a last poll before we go to the q a from the audience so you all have seen that we asked you first what were you looking for at this event but now we want to know what did you find most interesting out of our event so was it probably expanding the knowledge of supply chain technology learning about rei and the retail industry and maybe new ideas to improve your own companies or your own daily jobs. Um, so we, while we give you a minute to complete that poll, maybe Kellen, we can go to the first questions. Yeah, there's tons of awesome questions in here. So thank you everyone for participating. Uh, maybe just picking um, our, our first one here from Louis um, Chong. I apologize if I pronounced your name wrong. Um, but as the pandemic comes to an end, um, Amit, the question is for you, will REI continue to offer services that started during the pandemic? Um, so maybe like that curbside pickup, for example. Um, and what are the considerations that you're taking into account when making those decisions as the kind of the pandemic, hopefully at least we seem to be on the tail end of that um, experience, so. Yeah, I think that's a good question. And I think we have seen this pattern uh, even earlier when a lot of these omni-channel capabilities uh, were evolving, that as you offer new customer experience, I think that uh, just becomes the uh, customer habit and that becomes the new trend, right? Like the customers are so used to uh, all of these uh, different offerings now. Uh, so some of those offerings uh, will definitely continue, uh, again, depending on the customer needs. So obviously, uh, curbside uh, pickup is a very convenient option. So we do see uh, that customers uh, opt for that particular option also. But as the restrictions are uh, easing out, uh, there is definitely uh, the desire for the customers to come into the stores and then uh, interact not just with the product that they had purchased, but with uh, all of the other selection that we have. And I think one of the key strengths for REI is also the knowledge that we have inside our stores with our green vests, uh, the employees as we call them, because they are really the experts in their field. So definitely uh, the differentiator and a key uh, engagement uh, lever for our customers is also to interact with those experts. So I think we will definitely see a mix. Uh, I'm sure there will be you know, occasions or use cases where the convenience of the curbside pickup is helpful. So our customers will continue to opt for that. But when the customers or the stores are open, they would be able to uh, come in the store as well. Uh, the similar stuff around the returns, I think the self-service returns and the digital experience, that is more than uh, the pandemic. Uh, I think it's just the reflection of all of the growth within digital channel, whether it is uh, purchase or return. So I think those uh, pieces are definitely going to continue. Uh, the supply chain disruptions piece that I talked about with Notify Me or some of the back orders, I think that is one area which hopefully will evolve and will ease uh, as we see less of these disruptions where there is more predictability uh, in terms of the future uh, supply coming in. And then hopefully we can offer a uh, lot of the back order pre-order functionality, which is fairly limited currently. So I think some of those trends are going to continue and I'm sure uh, there will be new uh, experiences that would evolve uh, from that. Thank you, Amit. So we have a lot of questions indeed, mm -hmm. but uh, you mentioned a lot of times sustainability and mm -hmm. in your 
amazing goals. And our audience is curious to know uh, more about those sustainability goals you have. What are the actions that our AI is taking? And from the technology perspective, and if that's possible, um, how are you quantifying or how do you measure or keep track of those um, sustainability goals and accomplishments? Yeah, yeah. I think this is a topic that is near and dear to you know, our hearts. We have said we are going to reduce uh, our carbon footprint by 55% uh, by 2030. Uh, so there are a number of uh, things that we are already doing. So a lot, uh, most of not loss, like all of our operations within the US is run on renewable energy. So whether it is uh, the renewable energy or through the credits, it's all uh, being run on the uh, renewable energy side. Then also we have all of our distribution centers that are uh, lead certified at the highest level, looking at all of the sustainability as well as zero waste and uh, those programs. So we are already able to do uh, a lot of good work in terms of reducing our carbon footprint. But I think uh, Kellen mentioned this briefly earlier around uh, decarbonizing the upstream supply chain. So I think that is where you have a ton of opportunity because majority of our carbon footprint is happening uh, in the manufacture of the product as well as uh, through the distribution network to get to the uh, stores or the customers. So going all the way upstream to see how we can uh, decarbonize that supply chain, look at uh, uh, renewable energy sources even during the manufacturing. Uh, and then as you go through the uh, distribution and supply chain, uh, looking at again that uh, energy efficiency, clean energy, as well as reducing any of the packaging and uh, other areas uh, is some of those things that we are uh, looking at. But I think uh, the question brings up a really interesting perspective in terms of how are we measuring, quantifying, reporting, and most importantly, keeping uh, that option and giving that choice to the customers. because. Uh, we have talked uh, or we have heard a lot about next day, today, but I think there is so much awareness now where customers are willing to wait maybe that extra day if you are able to get uh, it to them uh, in a more sustainable manner. So uh, quantifying and tracking this is definitely a challenge. Um, again, right now, uh, we are required to uh, kind of collect all of this data, analyze, process it, and uh, there is a lot of manual work involved in uh, pulling the data together from a number of these uh, data sources. So we're looking at various options, partnerships, and whatever the case may be to even develop some of the solutions to uh, make sure that we are able to accurately track and report uh, on all of those carbon emissions, but then also reduce it and then uh, give the choice uh, for the customers uh, so that they can interact with our brand in a more sustainable manner. That's fascinating to hear your thoughts on the idea of like tracking and quantifying the upstream emissions, those scope three, if some might be familiar with the term scope three mm -hmm. emissions. I know it's a significant challenge for a lot of companies um, just because there's so many depths, you know, so many tiers of suppliers and so much complexity upstream. Mm -hmm. um, so just then jumping back here into the Q&A, there's another great question here, which actually I think is on our extra question list. Um, so I wanted to, wanted to be able to jump on this one. So this one is from uh, Nipun uh, Minon. And again, I apologize if I'm not pronouncing any of your names correctly. Um, but so the question is, um, what is your strategy for the select kind of the selection of supply chain sy systems? Um, is it best to breed um, or is it ERP, you know, expanded systems or, you know, obviously some kind of combination of the two. Um, so, you know, and then the question goes on, you know, what's the benefits of each of those strategies um, in your, from your perspective? Yeah, I think that's, that's a great question and something that we grapple with uh, within our technology teams uh, pretty much constantly. I think both of those um, approaches are viable. So you could look at uh, the traditional ERP system, um, which is providing all of those uh, capabilities. Um, and then obviously you can look at uh, all of these best of breed uh, solutions uh, that you will have to uh, integrate and eventually uh, provide all of the uh, capabilities. So each of the approaches comes with its own uh, set of advantages and also the challenges. If you look at um, a kind of that ERP solution providing all of these capabilities, uh, the biggest advantage there is, I think, just the data. Because when you have uh, all of the data across all of these different silos in different systems, integrating that is one of the uh, biggest challenge. Uh, and that uh, hinders our ability to even aggregate all of the data. If you want to apply any of the other tools, techniques on that, that becomes uh, really bottleneck. So if you go with that, uh, ERP type of pro approach, you are able to avoid a lot of those integrations. You have uh, a more robust and uh, integrated set of data. Uh, but at the same time, obviously, 
given the breadth of the uh, supply chain field and all of the you know, new trends, new technologies that evolving, uh, it's harder for a single uh, solution to be able to really uh, superior in all of those capabilities, right? You are trying to get that integration, but then you may not have the required level of maturity across all of those capabilities. And that's where new technology trends, whether it is cloud, the APIs, microservices, those are more nimble options where you can uh, develop some of the best of the breed uh, solutions. But then again, that will come with the integration challenges. So the way uh, we uh, think about it and approach it is what are our standard processes and standard capabilities where we are not differentiating uh, for our customers? How can we reuse and leverage as much as possible from uh, a fewer uh, set of solutions. So that way we're able to kind of take advantage of that uh, integration also. And uh, again, everything uh, that we think about or do is from that customer perspective. So what are the areas where you need to differentiate for the customer? So as you get closer to the customer, whether it is in terms of the omnichannel fulfillment, other areas, optimization is a great example where you really need that niche solution, whether it is homegrown or you need to tap into any of the other best of breed providers uh, to integrate that is how we look at it. So really try to keep it simple where it is standard and non-differentiating. And then as you get closer to the customer where you can be really uh, unique and uh, differentiating, uh, look at that uh, best of breed option uh, only for that niche uh, area is a good approach to kind of balance uh, both worlds. Thank you, Amit. So I guess in the interest of time, we should be sharing our poll results now. So um, Chan, if you can help us with that. Awesome. Thank you. So um, we asked you what was the most interesting part of today's session, and most of you say it was expanding your knowledge in supply chain technology and systems in general, so that's awesome. But you also highlighted understanding how technology can be used to respond disruptions and build resilience. So we are very happy that Amit brought so many details uh, to the audience. I don't know if you want to add anything else on this poll results, Amit. I think it's interesting. Yeah, I think um, the technology and the knowledge, expanding knowledge, I think seems to be the theme, which is great uh, for the student as they can uh, continue to go through the various four or five courses of the micro master's program. Yeah, that's great. Awesome. I don't know, Kellan, if we have time for one more questions or we can wrap it up. Yeah, I think maybe we could do one more um, brief question. I don't know if you have one keyed up or I have one here too. Go ahead. So I have a question, I think this maybe ties into the um, you know, discussion on omni-channel, but maybe it extends it. I'm not actually sure if you mentioned it or not, but um, so it's Mike, Michael Lett has a question here on um, the idea of dropship. I um, mean, he's wondering if REI does dropship and then maybe if I just expand on his question a little bit, what are the complexities that come in to play with dropship where you have that vendor, you know, the, the shipment coming straight from the vendor to the customer versus through the, in your case, REI network. And what are some of the complexities that come into play with that particular channel? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, uh, we do offer uh, or rely on our dropship partners to provide um, uh, that fulfillment. So one of the key advantages is uh, kind of that extended aisle and then uh, offering a wide, uh, wider assortment to the customers uh, than we can just based on our uh, inventory investments within our own network. So that definitely uh, is an advantage uh, and we do offer that uh, to meet that customer demand. Uh, the complexity I would say is threefold. So first, if I just go back to our inventory availability uh, concept, uh, getting that timely feed from all of these um, dropship partners is a challenge. Uh, they have different business models. So not everyone is going to be able to have a dedicated pool of inventory reserved for you. What they're trying to do is they have a pool of inventory and they're servicing uh, several other retailers, other uh, brands and things like that. So getting that uh, uh, timely feed and just the frequency is also a challenge. I think the technology investments and the technology maturity of different partners is varying. So not everybody will be able to do uh, a near real-time integration and things like that. So that's going to create latency which could affect the customer experience. So I think the First and foremost challenge is in terms of the inventory. Uh, second, uh, again, I'll go back to the customer promise piece that I had mentioned. Uh, each of these partners has different level of uh, maturity uh, in terms of even fulfillment or more than maturity, even the options that they may have. Not everybody uh, might be located where all of the carriers are uh, serving, right? So based on the carriers, what are the different service levels that the carriers are able to offer? And that is going to have a direct impact on whether the customer gets the product in a timely manner. And then uh, to tie back to some of our earlier discussion around returns, that creates a complexity. Now you had a dropship 
product. So if uh, the customers want to return it, how is that going to be handled? Is it going back to the dropship partner? Is it coming to the store? Is it coming to your location? So I think it is really that end-to-end -end value chain, starting all the way from inventory, the customer promise, the fulfillment and returns. I think each of the phases has its own unique challenges. And then trying to do that with the same set of uh, core uh, systems that you have uh, adds more complexity because you have different integrations, different perspectives for your own network and own inventory versus the dropship inventory. Thank you. Thank you for that last one, Kellen, as well. So, all right, we're coming up to the hour almost. So I wanted to close this by thanking Amit for taking the time today. We know you're super busy and you've been sharing your experience here and your knowledge, and we truly appreciate it. I know myself, I learned a lot. So I hope you in the audience did as well. I mean, I don't know if you will have any final words you want to share with our audience. We also have learners here from our MicroMaster program. Any recommendation from someone jumping into supply chain technology or even jumping into supply chain you want to give us? I think, uh, thank you so much for uh, having me today. I really enjoyed the conversation. Uh, hopefully it was helpful for uh, our students and the audience members as well. And I would love to stay connected uh, with this community and participate in this program or other research wherever I can help. So thank you so much. Uh, all the best for uh, all the students for their uh, finals and the exams. And thanks and have a wonderful day. Yeah, thank you, Amit. I want to echo Laura's um, comments and say how much we appreciate you sharing your time and your knowledge with us today. Um, I also want to thank our audience for participating in today's event and the polls and all the great questions in the Q&A there. I know we have way more than we had time to get to. And we hope you enjoyed the discussion and have some good